Okay, yeah, we want to try the egg. I'm a little afraid. So these are like golden yellow nuggets. They're totally, these are egg corn puffs. N- well, not corn. Or more like those little styrofoam things. No, styrofoam packing peanuts, but they smell like egg. Yes. Mmm. Mm. Mm. Well, Tastes like egg. Tastes great. I mean, I love eggs. Mmm, <laughs> styrofoam packing peanuts that taste like eggs. But really, people, they tasted good. And we were surprised because they are the military food of the future. And frankly, rations don't have a great reputation for deliciousness. You are listening to Gastropod, the podcast that looks at food through the lens of science and history. I'm Cynthia Graber. And I'm Nicola Twilley. And this episode, we are enlisting our taste buds and heading into the lab to explore how the military gets fed. We get to the bottom of some important questions. Why have eggs made for soldiers' rations always tasted so bad? Why is it so hard to make those perfect packets of protein portable? And does what the military eats actually matter? Can food Food win wars? Plus, from hot pockets to trendy cold pressed juices, how does their food affect what ends up on our dinner tables, too? But first, with a wide range of organic, gluten free, and stone ground products, Bob's Red Mill has been making it possible to eat healthy and cook delicious food for decades. Whether you're gluten free, vegan, or just want the highest quality products, Bob's Red Mill is your go to. All of Bob's high quality products, from oats and grains to flours and meals, are minimally processed from their stone mill in Oregon. Head to Bob's Red Mill com to shop and explore their huge range of products and get inspiration from hundreds of recipes. That's bobsredmill.com. Did you know that your skin can absorb up to 60% of what you put on it? So what goes on your skin can be as important as what goes in your body. Juice Beauty is a skincare and makeup line that is made with certified organic ingredients with the promise to always formulate without potentially harmful ingredients. Go to juicebeauty.com slash gastropod for exclusive savings on your first order when you use the code gastropod20 at checkout. Scrambled eggs was the first thing I ever learned to cook for myself. Eggs are still my go-to for the simplest possible last resort dinner when I'm tired and there's nothing else in the house. Ready in minutes, delicious, good for you, and pretty much impossible to screw up, right? Exactly. But when it comes to eggs on the battlefield, not so simple. Military food scientists have been trying to perfect eggs for decades, and they've been failing. This is a dehydrated eggs mix butter flavored, and this uh, was something that would have been made uh, in a field kitchen. So instead of having to try to bring dozens and dozens of eggs up to the battlefield, to the field kitchen, uh, they would use these dehydrated egg mixes. That's David Aseta. I was in Desert Storm. I was in uh, the Second Iraq War. I was in Afghanistan, a bunch of other different places. I ate a lot of MREs. Today, David is head of public affairs at the U.S. Army Natick Soldier Research Development and Engineering Center. That's a mouthful in itself. But one of the things they do at the Natick Center, as we're going to call it for short, is develop the Army's food. So those dehydrated flaked eggs are grim. But they would be what you would get in field kitchens. They're not the kind of food a soldier would carry with them to eat on the front lines. And actually, David kind of likes the dehydrated eggs. When I first came in the Army and we were still eating the ones in the cans, the omelet in the can was also my favorite. And it was pretty easy because since nobody liked it, uh, I could always trade whatever I had for it. Eggs in a can were an innovation in their time, as we'll discover. But the army does not rest on its quest to make the perfect portable egg. The omelets in a can were not a hit. So the scientists at the Natick Center introduced a pouch version of an omelet, eggs in a bag, because everyone wanted eggs. The folks at Natick were very excited about their new veggie omelet in a bag. They took it up to Alaska to field test it on the troops there, and it performed well. But then they added it to the meal rotation, and everyone, well, let's just say that the nickname for this veggie omelet was Vomlet. If you look online on soldier and veteran forums, there are a lot of feelings about the Vomlet. One of the few descriptions I can read aloud without wanting to Vomlet myself is this one. Opening the entree packet is like walking into a stale egg fart in a thrift store dressing room. So not a huge success, although David didn't seem to mind. You know, it didn't taste like a fresh omelet, uh, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't bad in my opinion. It's possible that David may just be too fond of eggs to be a good judge. 
But so why has the humble egg defeated the mighty force of the U.S. military research and development team for so long? We asked Michelle Richardson. She's a senior food technologist at Natick. Well, number one, eggs have a very high pH. pH measures the acidity of the product. The lower the pH, the more acidic the food. And the more acidic the food, the more shelf-stable it is. Because bacteria can't grow in it. Uh, I think eggs have a pH of 7. Think of tomato paste, which is very stable. It may have a pH below 4. So that's the big difference. So pH is a problem. But why? We have to back up here because part of the egg challenge is just that there are a lot of hoops any food has to go through to make it in the military. Yeah, I think it's all a big puzzle. Jeremy Witsit is deputy director for the combat feeding program. He laid the whole puzzle out for us. Because certainly nutrition and, and providing the right amount of calories is key, but doing it in a product that's lightweight and low volume that can sit on the shelf for at least three years, that can withstand being dragged through the mud and dropped out of aircraft and high temperatures, low temperatures. And then at the end of the day, it's got to taste good because if it doesn't taste good, they're not going to eat it. So all that science doesn't do any good anyways. And you got all those different factors converging into this big puzzle. And that's really encapsulates our mission here is to make that puzzle come together. So like Jeremy said, these army grade pre-scrambled eggs have to be able to last three years without refrigeration. Whereas a normal omelet, if you left that out on your countertop, you wouldn't want to eat it the next morning unless you were really trying to give yourself food poisoning. As Michelle told us, eggs aren't acidic enough to scare off dangerous microbes. And then there's another problem when you try to process eggs for long-term storage. One way to kill off any potential critters is to heat foods to really high temperatures. And what happens to eggs? A lot of times when you process eggs, they turn green. (laughs) Especially if you're doing, like, high heat. Um, They did have a retort egg in the MRE years ago, but it was one of the least liked items, so they had to remove it. Retort egg is not something you find on the menu at your typical diner. So we asked Michelle to explain what happens to an egg when it's retorted. So it's put into this big unit, and you have high temperature and high pressure to kill any uh, bacteria in there. So that's the sterilization process. Retorting eggs will turn them green. And retorting eggs, basically cooking them at high heat, it takes a long time to make them sterile. Many of you will know what happens when you cook eggs for too long. I have made this mistake. They turn into rubber. You have textural issues that you need to deal with. And so when we process the retorted eggs, you have to add a lot of things to stabilize the texture, which may contribute to all flavors. So it's just very difficult to get something shelf stable that still tastes good. The egg challenge has bedeviled PhD scientists literally for decades. Soldiers want eggs, but for the most part, they do not want rubbery green eggs that smell like a fart in a thrift store changing room. No, they most certainly do not. Which is why our tasting of those delicious dehydrated egg puffs was so incredibly revolutionary. They're made using a new technology that you might have encountered at your local Starbucks. Vacuum microwave drying is used currently to produce that moon cheese, for an example. But we're taking it one step further and compressing it so that we get the dried product in a small, compact space for rations. Lauren Alexic leads the food engineering and analysis team at Natick. And that moon cheese she's talking about, that's that weird cheese puff snack thing they sell at Starbucks that's kind of like a disappointing Cheeto. It's a vacuum microwave cheese. It's a, it's a real cheese product just with moisture removed. This vacuum microwave drying works through a combination of vacuum pressure as well as microwave radiation. Together, the two approaches dry out food at a much lower temperature than oven drying much faster. So more nutrients and flavors and colors are left in the final product. Basically, it's a gentler process. And so the food still ends up sterile, but also way more appealing and better for you. The samples we tried had just shown up in the lab that very morning from a Canadian partner lab that specializes in this vacuum microwave drying technology. We were we're excited to try them. Michelle was too. Yeah, it does. It tastes nice. It has very nice egg flavor. I like the color retention. It's hard to retain a, a yellow egg color after you process it. So that's really nice. So maybe eggs have actually been solved? And it's only taken 50 years. Eggs are just one example of the way scientists have been trying to figure out how to best feed the military for many, many decades now. But the question of how to feed soldiers goes back a lot farther in time. Back as far as ancient Egypt. The first organized armies, this is 4,000 years ago in ancient Sumer, 
they thought there were wars super nearby, so they could just go home for dinner. But that didn't work for the ancient Egyptians. They ended up with a territory covering 400,000 square miles. And they did, in fact, um, carry rations with them. Anastasia Marx de Salcedo wrote a book called Combat Ready Kitchen. She told us that Egyptian troops carried little cakes made out of barley, some greens, and dried fish. And this was so important because it provided a portable protein, that it was actually part of their wages. This grain-onion combo continued to be the mainstay of military rations. In ancient Greece, the notoriously austere Spartans added some goat cheese and sour wine to the mix. But each soldier was expected to carry his own two-week grain supply at all times, which weighed at least 30 pounds. The ancient Roman Empire stretched across continents, and the armies had to be well-fed to have conquered all that territory. They ate all sorts of cured pork products, prosciutto and bacon and sausage. Like the Egyptians, Roman soldiers were actually paid in food, salt pork specifically, which took care of their salary, sodium needs, and dinner all in one go. The Roman army also ate Parmesan and other hard cheeses. They had a twice-baked cracker called hardtack. And for thousands of years, military food stayed pretty much the same. Grain, some salty preserved protein, and maybe a little onion to spice things up. In case this isn't totally obvious, solving the question of how to keep soldiers well-fed is really crucial to any conquering army. The soldiers are working hard and sweating, and they're probably not near a kitchen or campfire, and they have to eat enough and eat well enough to not get sick and keep up their strength on the battlefield. Otherwise, you lose the battle. Or those hungry soldiers desert en masse because their priority becomes finding food, not fighting. And that way, you also lose the battle. Figuring out how to feed the military has always been pretty hard, mainly because over the course of nearly all of human history, we haven't had many good solutions for preserving food in ways that are also light and portable. The reason that rations had not changed in millennia was because there were no new food preservation techniques. And so rations relied on drying, salting, curing, and smoking. And so even as late as the French and American Revolutionary Wars, what soldiers were carrying in their rucksacks was pretty much the same thing as the Roman legionnaires almost 2,000 years earlier. And then everything changes. Thanks to Napoleon, some hot water, and a candy maker. Dinner, within the army and without, has never been the same. But first, we want to tell you about one of our sponsors this episode, Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. It's officially spring, time to get going on some spring cleaning. This year, use Mr. Clean Magic Eraser to take on the impossible stains your sprays and wipes can't. All you have to do is wet it under the tap, give it a squeeze, and it's ready to erase. And because it cleans with water alone, you don't have to worry about harsh cleaning fumes or scents. Grimy bathrooms and kitchens? That's Mr. Clean Magic Eraser's sweet spot. But after we talked about the invention of the Mr. Clean Magic Eraser last episode, we heard from a listener in Baltimore. Apparently, audiophiles use Mr. Clean Magic Eraser to clean the stylus, that's the needle, on their high-end turntables. So for all kinds of spring cleaning, definitely try Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. It makes cleaning your toughest kitchen and bathroom messes fast and easy. Check out mrclean.com slash gastropod to see more ways the Magic Eraser can help you knock out impossible messes all around the house. Part of why Cynthia and I love making gastropods so much, even though it kills us, is the chance to learn about all kinds of fascinating new things. With The Great Courses Plus, you have unlimited access to learn about anything that interests you from award-winning experts. And right now, as one of our listeners, you can enjoy The Great Courses Plus for free. There's over 9,000 lectures in virtually any category, history, science, literature, and hobbies like gardening and cooking, or one of my favorite subjects, wine. Check out the Everyday Guide to Wine to learn when champagne got its bubbles. Yes, that's right. The world's most famous sparkling wine was still and pale pink until just a few hundred years ago. You can watch from any smartphone, tablet, laptop, TV, or stream the audio with The Great Courses Plus app. And for a limited time only, they're giving our listeners a special free month of unlimited access to all of their lectures. Start your special free one-month trial today. Sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash gastropod. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash gastropod. During the French Revolutionary War, there was a lot of hunger and starvation experienced both by citizens and soldiers. And this may have been the impetus. Um, We do not 
know for sure. At the time Napoleon was a young man rising through the military ranks, it might be because of the hunger he saw during the revolution, but in any case, one of Napoleon's top priorities when he became emperor was to figure out a better way to feed those hungry French troops. After all, he needed that army to help him take over all of Europe. So Napoleon offered a 12,000 franc award for anyone who could come up with a new improved preservation method. Enter Nicolas Appert. I like to describe Nicolas Appert as a bad boy celebrity chef turned candy maker. Uh, He decided to meet this challenge, and it turned out that a candy making uh, store was actually the perfect place to do so. And the reason was is that it has a lot of very specialized equipment. Because Nicolas was a candy maker, he already knew how to preserve fruit by preparing it in syrups, jams, and jellies inside sealed glass containers. So he decided to see if he could do the same sort of thing with other foods. He took vegetables, meat stews, peas and beans, and put them in sealed glass jars too. And then he would put that glass vessel into a larger um, metal vessel with boiling water. This is actually a technique called the water bath. Another name for this water bath is a bain-marie, literally Mary's bath. The invention is attributed to a woman, to a Jewish alchemist. She's the first known woman alchemist. She lived in Egypt in the first century CE. So when you use a double boiler to melt chocolate or make a hollandaise sauce, you're using a device invented in an attempt to transform base metal into gold. Which it does not do. But it is an amazing tool to hold the temperature steady at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, the boiling point of water, for as long as you want. Your food doesn't overheat and burn, and more importantly, it stays at that temperature long enough to kill all the microbes. Nicolas did not know about microbes, but he experimented. Nicolas put his jars of soups and stews into the bamery. And then he would cook the food for a period of time and then stopper up the bottle. And it worked. And he actually began to sell his product to the middle class in glass bottles, and he called it uh, Spring, Summer, and Fall in a Bottle, which is a lovely poetic name. Once Nicolas had this process perfected, he brought his most delicious examples to the Navy to see whether they would win him Napoleon's big cash prize. And although it took the government a while, eventually he went home with 12,000 francs in return for giving up the rights to his invention. But his invention relied on glass jars. It took another guy to come up with an alternative, the tin can. Though even these weren't ideal because workers could only make six to ten tin cans a day. So I don't think it was something that was used except an addition to the normal rations and possibly for officers' mess, um, which is actually what happened in during the Civil War. Cans were only supplied to officers, um, and I believe it was canned uh, condensed milk. And the uh, regular enlisted men did not have access to this kind of food. So what about our Candyman inventor? Nicolas Appert got the cash prize, like we said, and he used it to set up a bottling factory. For a while, life was good. He's even credited with inventing peppermint schnapps as an ice cream topping. But he'd given away the rights to his best idea, the canning, not the peppermint schnapps. And his factory was trashed when Napoleon's enemies invaded France. A pair ended up dying anonymous and a pauper. What's just as bad, or maybe even worse, is that you've probably never heard of Nicolas Appert because he isn't given credit for basically inventing pasteurization. That's because he had no idea why his invention worked. Louis Pasteur discovered how microbes cause food to spoil and why the bain-marie kills pathogens. That's why this canning process keeps food safe longer. But Nicolas Appert discovered the process itself first. But today, it's pasteurizing, not appertizing. It takes more than a century to get to the next big incentive to improve military food, and that's World War II. Between 1939 and 1945, the military went from feeding just under 400,000 soldiers to having to provide three meals a day for more than 12 million recruits stationed all over the world. By then, the military had some new foods for the troops. They had this new ready-to-eat meal called the sea ration, which was unappetizing gray stew in a can in a single-serving portion. And uh, it also had some dried rations. It had a chocolate bar, which was called the D-ration. And this was something that was had been made to be deliberately unpalatable so that soldiers would use it in an emergency. 
these rations didn't fare so well when they were shipped around the world. First of all, their packaging didn't stand up to different climates and conditions, so the cans rusted. Um, the uh, cellophane on the D rations allowed water in and they became soggy. On top of that, the soldiers complained that the fat in the C ration stew separated and went rancid. The meat tasted as if it had been cooked for months. The eggs and dairy smelled revolting, and the cans themselves were weighty and unwieldy. This was one of the reasons that the U.S. turned around and decided to invest a lot more in food science research during the war. So over the course of the four years of World War II, um, a small laboratory that really started as an ad hoc thing uh, with three employees, two of whom were former cooking instructors, uh, one of whom was a secretary, a very uh, small supply of battered equipment. That tiny ad hoc lab was transformed. It became a huge research center with around 300 employees specializing in chemistry and vitamins and packaging. They partnered with 500 university and industrial food science labs. That whole system stayed in place after the war, and it became part of the policy of preparedness so that we would always be Uh, ready at an instant's notice to be able to enter a large multinational scrum such as World War II. So the Natick Center is a direct descendant of that system. And the Natick Center is where Cynthia and I were lucky enough to sample the military's next-gen eggs. Eggs like... 5.0? The research center was constructed in the 1960s, and it houses departments that are in charge of studying all kinds of things, like soldiers' clothing and shelter. But of course, they also are in charge of what soldiers eat. So we do the research, development, test, and evaluation for food that uh, our warfighters are eating, either on the battlefield and in some cases in a garrison environment, so a dining facility and, and things like that. We've met Jeremy already this episode. He's deputy director of the Combat Feeding Program. And our first stop at Natick was actually him taking us on a trip backwards in time through a little museum they've set up to showcase the unappetizing history of U.S. military food. Yeah, so this is kind of a a walk through history, and it's certainly not comprehensive history of of military rations, but I think uh, you'll get a good taste for it. Jeremy started us with the Revolutionary War. The soldiers ate hardtack, that super dry cracker, and preserved pork. Then there's an entire section dedicated to that giant leap forward. The tin can. The can was was good against preventing moisture and bugs and things from getting into the food and, and making go uh, go bad. But if you can imagine having all these cans kind of on your person and either in your rucksack or in your cargo pockets and not only the weight but trying to assume like a quick position on the ground, those cans are like digging into your legs. Not the most comfortable. But that was the deal throughout World War II and even Vietnam. Soldiers were expected to stuff up to nine tins of food into their field jacket along with their grenades and ammunition. According to reports from the time, two out of every three cans were thrown away. Until 1980, when the can finally met its replacement. The folks at the Natick Center had been working on a can alternative forever since 1959. It was their main priority. The researchers finally, after decades, managed to create a flexible foil-lined pouch that could be sterilized and hermetically sealed and ripped open at mealtime. This is it, people. This is the MRE. The meal ready to eat, as it's called in the Army's special C-3PO way of talking. Woohoo! Mission accomplished. The team at Natick gave themselves a giant round of applause. Job well done. And this flexible MRE was indeed great. But then, David says, the U.S. entered into the next major battlefield, this time in the Middle East, Desert Storm. So if you look at the initial invasion of Iraq in 1991 and Operation Desert Storm, and then again in 2003... Uh, There wasn't time to stop and set up field kitchens and serve uh, soldiers and Marines hot food. So they ate MREs, and that was the only thing that they had. And if they had to eat them three times a day, then they ate them three times a day. But the problem was they weren't eating them. These new MREs might have been lighter and easier to carry thanks to the revolutionary flexible pouch, but there were only 12 different menus which led to problems that the Natick team diplomatically referred to as 
menu fatigue. Even if you liked all 12, uh, you were going to eat the same thing over again within a period of three or four days. But the troops weren't eating them all. Once again, they were throwing a lot away. That meant they just weren't getting enough food. Or if they did manage to scrounge through the package or trade to get snacks that they liked, they weren't getting the nutrition that they needed. The army says the troops were suffering physically and cognitively. Boredom wasn't the only reason soldiers weren't eating their MREs. It was also because they frequently had to consume these meal pouches cold. It's because they had to use fuel tabs to heat up water. Lauren Alexic told us the fuel tabs couldn't be packaged with the food, and so they didn't always show up in the same place at the same time as the MREs. Really, there was no way of heating that food in the field. They can eat it cold, but from a morale standpoint, from an acceptability standpoint, they like it much better when it's heated. So yeah, cold meatballs and marinara sauce from a pouch, three meals a day... I think I'd end up deciding it was better to be a little hungry sometimes, too. So now the team at Natick has a new huge challenge ahead. They have a lightweight foil pouch, but how can the team create a new way to heat the food that can be packaged with the food so the people in the field won't be stuck in a situation where they have fuel bars but don't have their MREs, or they have their MREs but the fuel bars didn't make it? And beyond this thermal challenge, how did the fact that all these soldiers were throwing their pouches away uneaten lead to a whole new era of shelf-stable hot pockets and even military pizza? But first, we want to tell you about another of our sponsors this episode. With a wide range of organic, gluten-free, and stone ground products, Bob's Red Mill has been making it possible to eat healthy and cook delicious food for decades. Whether you're gluten-free, vegan, or just want the highest quality products, Bob's Red Mill is your go-to. In previous episodes, we told you that Bob of Bob's Red Mill is a real person, and that in the 60s, he searched the country to find quartz millstones to start his own flour mill. Then, in 1988, the mill burned down. But the stones survived. Grain from the second floor fell on them, putting out the flames around them and keeping them from shattering in the heat. Bob rebuilt, bigger and better, and opened a dedicated gluten-free mill in 1991. Today, all of Bob's high-quality products, from oats and grains to flours and meals, are still minimally processed from their stone mill in Oregon. Head to bobsredmill.com to shop and explore their huge range of products and get inspiration from hundreds of recipes. That's bobsredmill.com. So here's our situation. The food is cold. This does not help with, quote, palatability. The army needs another breakthrough. They get to work after the first Gulf War, and in 1993, which is kind of record-breaking speed for the military, they come up with a winner. So the flameless ration heater uh, allows them to have hot food anywhere that they are, because all you need to do is add water, and it's an exothermic reaction. And we just happen to have with us here Lori Alexic, who was instrumental in the development of the flameless ration heater. So this is a very small lightweight chemical heater that is magnesium and iron based and when the soldier is ready to heat up his main entree he slides the flexible pouch down inside of this bag and adds water up until the fill lines and then within about maybe four or five minutes the the heater starts to activate and it just produces heat and steam and will heat the entree up till about 140 degrees Fahrenheit good serving temperature in about eight minutes. A company called Zestotherm in Ohio had developed this technology as a heating pad. Lauren adapted it for the military. Basically, as Lauren said, it works by combining magnesium and iron, and then you add water in the field. The natural reaction of those elements is to produce heat, but it doesn't produce heat very quickly. So we added salt as a catalyst for that reaction, and it takes off fast. All this talk of magnesium and iron was making me hungry. Plus, we wanted to experience some of that steam heat for ourselves. So we decided to have lunch, army style. David used his pocket knife to open a big cardboard box full of MREs. Okay, here's your vegetarian meal. Menu number three, vegetable crumbles with pasta in taco style sauce. Sounds fun. Does that yeah. Sound like a winner. Okay, yeah, maybe. What am I going to get? You get lucky. You get spaghetti and uh, meatballs and marinara sauce. Yes. Oh, you get the one they all want. Nikki, you apparently scored big time. Yep. David told us that meatballs is the most popular entree out of all 24 MREs. All right. So. Inside the foil pouch was not just our veggie crumbles and marinara meatballs, but a whole bunch of other little foil packets filled with random things to eat. 
It was kind of like a stocking on Christmas morning. Italian breadsticks. Jalapeno cashews. Teriyaki beef stick. This is my, I don't know, this doesn't say anything. That mystery was actually a pouch of cooked pears. There was an oatmeal cookie, a powdered drink, jalapeno cheese spread, something called a first strike energy bar. Ooh, and I got chunky peanut butter. Yum. Uh, I'm jealous of that. Crackers. Awesome. Now, one thing that you have to keep in mind is that these are designed for troops in a very active environment. So you're looking at 12 to 1,500 calories if you eat this whole thing, which is more than a sedentary adult might need in one day. You're saying that we're not as active as the military? I don't know here. <laughs> well, I'm saying that I shouldn't eat this whole thing at one meal. At this point, our stomachs were rumbling. It was time to bust out Lauren's secret weapon, the flameless ration heater. All right, and then you want to make sure that the water is circulating around and gets to that pad that has the uh, iron and magnesium powder in it. And once it activates, you'll start to see Ooh, the steam some come steam. out. That's so cool. Yeah, oh my gosh, it's, it's steaming. Nikki, take a picture. <laughs> and I don't know if you can, the microphone will pick up. I don't know if you can hear it. Yes, you certainly can hear it. That's the sound of flameless ration heater steam. I know the whole point of this flameless heater is that it heats up the food, but it was kind of shocking how quickly it got too hot to touch. While we waited the eight minutes Lauren had recommended, we snacked. So I'm opening my, um, wait, what did you call it? Dehydrated bread concept? Uh, no. It's shelf stable. Shelf stable bread. Shelf stable bread. Like the well brought up individual I am, I shared my Italian breadsticks with the table. So this is not bread. But it's also not not bread. It's kind of like a soft, thick cracker. Soft and thick and still quite moist. So the creation of the shelf-stable soft dish bread was a major innovation over the hard tech of centuries past, but I have to admit, we didn't love it. Okay, so I'm going to try my... Um... Oh, yeah? Yeah. It smells totally like the kind of taco-y, pasta, veggie, fake meat thing. And there you have some on your microphone. Oh, I do. Oops. It tastes like, you know, those cans of like veggie, pasta, and kind of fake meat stuff that I would have eaten early on in my vegetarian days. It's mm. totally tasty. Now that I'm not sitting next to the people who work on this, I can admit that it wouldn't be my first choice or even my second choice for lunch. That said, it really did taste like something I would have eaten decades ago from a can. My problem was that my expectations had been raised. Meatballs are the troop favorite. I was expecting something a little... Frankly, tastier. Little meatballs, orange sauce. Mmm, not bad. Weirdly, it's a tiny bit of an aftertaste that is different from what I'm expecting. Let me put my finger on it. I was trying to be nice. I didn't try your meal, but Nikki, it was clear that you didn't love it. If you are sitting in a building at a table and you've got heat and you've got electricity uh, and you're eating your MRE, uh, you may not appreciate it in the same way that you would appreciate it if you were cold, wet, tired, and hungry and sitting in the dark in the rain on a mountainside in Afghanistan. David is trying to say in the nicest possible way that Cynthia and I are spoiled brats. Point taken. But the other point is that these are huge improvements over the MREs that people ate during Desert Storm. And innovating in new food products and making MREs tastier and more healthful, that's all still going on today. Including years of R&D to develop the holy grail of rations, shelf-stable pizza. Michelle, the, the pizza was the most desired and asked for product in the MRE. And she tackled that every challenge that came along with developing that pizza and stuck with it until we overcame every single hurdle. Michelle Richardson spearheaded the pizza development research. As a civilian, pizza for dinner seems like the lazy option, but pizza was a full-on egg-level military food science nightmare. And when you come up with this idea to give them the pizza, but then you put all these different things, we have the cheese, we have the pepperoni, we have the sauce, and we have the bread. And they all have different characteristics when it comes to water activity and pH. Let's start with water activity. Imagine leaving pizza out on the countertop. It gets soggy. Michelle says the first thing the team had to do is control the water activity in the pizza. 
The problem is that water wants to migrate from the wetter ingredients, like sauce and cheese, to the ones that you would like to keep dry, like the crust. So if you have a bread with a water activity that's very similar to the water activity of the pepperoni and the cheese, you can kind of control that migration, because the migration is based on the water activity difference. And so we try not to have a big gradient so you don't get that migration. How does Michelle make sauce that has the same water activity as a much drier bread with something called humectants? These are incorporated into the sauce and they bind to the water to keep the water in the sauce and away from the bread. We use different things like our rice syrup is one of the components. Salt is an excellent, well, probably one of the best humectants. However, it would also contribute to the flavor. So it's like a balancing act. And so we use things like glycerol, which is the backbone of a fatty acid and a major component of a lot of foods and candies nowadays. And so by looking at different concentrations of those ingredients, we're able to lower the water activity in the sauce. Success. But it's not enough that the pizza doesn't go soggy. It also has to stay good for three years without refrigeration. All that lovely moist cheese and pepperoni, it has to not grow mold or bacteria. To stop the pizza from becoming a food poisoning nightmare, the team uses something called hurdle technologies. And you can think of hurdle technologies as a a series of barriers that you can put into food to prevent the growth of bacteria. And so what we looked at is different um, technologies or different hurdles that we can incorporate into the food. Michelle told us that she played around with a lot of different ways to reduce microbe growth without messing up the taste and texture. We'll use preservatives, and, you know, we try to use natural preservatives. Um, In the shelf-stable sandwiches, uh, we use things like um, mold inhibitors, yeast inhibitors, and things like that. We also use pasteurization. We consider the baking step a pasteurization step. Then we also use packaging as another hurdle. So the idea is that one of these alone will not make the food stable, but in combination it will. The MREs are supposed to last three years in the field. But luckily, Michelle doesn't have to leave her packaged pizza out for three years to make sure it's still tasty and safe to eat. They've developed ways to mimic that three-year time frame. They make sure that no undesirable microbes are growing and that the pizza hasn't collapsed into a soggy mess. This shelf life testing is one of the last steps for Michelle, but at that point, pizza was still not ready for prime time. Next, it had to be taste-tested in the field. Pizza is one dish that people have been practically begging for. And after Michelle worked on the pizza conundrum for five years with lots and lots of iterations, this version has aced both the lab safety and the field taste tests. I think besides uh, pizza, beer is one of the other things they want. And so we were actually happy when we actually were able to solve this problem and give it to them. This will probably go into the next MRE. Pizza may finally be solved, but the work is never done. In the same lab as Michelle, the Food Engineering and Analysis Lab, there are all sorts of scientists working on all sorts of weird future ration concepts. That's really cool. We call this the Willy Wonka Lab. Hopefully nobody will blow up into a big uh, purple (laughs) something. We walked around the lab with Tom, Michelle, and Lauren. No, nobody was blowing up into a giant purple bubble. And they showed us 3D printed food on demand. They're checking out a new microwave sterilizing technology that's faster than boiling pouches in water, so the food keeps more of its flavor and nutrition. We tried out those egg puff bites. The eggs won't be in the MRE in the near future, but hopefully soon. Senior food technologist Tom Yang worked on those, and he has a few more projects in the pipeline. This is uh, a French technology. I uh, happened to encounter this technology about uh, 15 years ago. The particular problem that was bothering Tom 15 years ago is the jerky problem. The way to make jerky is by soaking meat in brine, which is a problem already because the Natick team wants to keep sodium levels down. So it's very salty. And after we store that regular jerky for two, three years, become very brittle. The fibers in the meat get more and more tightly bound together over time, and the jerky gets too crunchy. So this French technology Tom came across, again, 15 years ago, it's called Osmo Food. And the way it works is that it uses a sugar solution, maltodextrin specifically, to lure some of the moisture out of the food. You grind up the meat, any meat, beef, pork, chicken, ostrich, goat, meat, whatever, or even fish. You grind it up and extrude it into a sheet, like a fruit roll-up, very thin two millimeter sheet, and go through this osmotic tank, which contains a sugar solution, but very concentrated. The sheet of meat comes out of the tank in a condition that Tom calls semi-moist. And it's versatile. 
we, we try it. After two or three years, it's still soft and juicy. Not like a conventional jerky, it's very hard like a rock. We didn't actually get to taste this product, so we were just going by Tom's description. But I think our favorite project of Tom's was his salad bar. I'm so intrigued by the salad bar. You can munch it. It's just uh, balsamic vinegar. Oh, that's good. A salad MRE? Whatever next. If only. These salad bars were not exactly that. They were freeze-dried. The military actually invented freeze-drying back in World War II, but they don't use it a lot at Natick. It's too expensive. And actually, if you freeze-dry just a solo vegetable, it becomes woody and tasteless. So Tom first marinates his vegetables in different flavors of salad dressing before he freeze-dries them into a bar. It definitely improves the flavor. And then he wraps his marinated freeze-dried salad mix inside these groovy vegetable-based wrappings that Michelle found for him. And ta-da! A salad bar. So now Tom knows his salad dressing wrapper trick works and tastes good. But because freeze drying is expensive, Tom's looking for a new process to make his salad bar. He thinks maybe vacuum microwave drying is going to be the way to go. That's what they used on the egg puffs we tasted. I'm guessing it's going to be a few years before the salad bar is in the field. All this weird vacuum microwaved egg puffs and freeze dried salad bars and fish roll ups, they're not just about making military food taste better and be more nutritious. The demand signal that we keep getting from the force is we want it lighter, we want it lower in volume. You know, we want to be able to stick our guys out for seven days without resupplying them. Jeremy Witsit is deputy director for the Combat Feeding Program, and he wants to make sure that the people in the field get just what they need, because today's wars are different from the wars of the past. When the generals lay out their vision for the future of war, It doesn't usually include details such as what the troops will be eating. But dinner is a detail that actually matters. Jeremy told us a story about a bar his team had developed for the 82nd Airborne. That's a parachute division, and they'd been seeing a bunch of injuries on their jumps. But the idea is sometimes these guys haven't eaten for six to eight hours before they're getting ready to jump, and it's kind of a mentally rigorous task that they're asked to do. So they were theorizing that, hey, maybe it's a lack of food, a lack of nutrition. They're kind of making these little mental mistakes that are increasing these static line injuries. So researchers at Natick took their super energy-dense first strike bar, which has a lot of calories in it, and they added 200 milligrams of caffeine to it because caffeine obviously helps with concentration. We made those in-house, about 5,000 of them, and delivered them to the 82nd Airborne. They jumped into Poland and Germany with them in about an hour before they were due to jump. Each soldier would take it out of there cargo pocket or their, their sleeve pocket, eat it. And um, it's, it's anecdotal evidence at this point, but the amount of injuries they had dramatically decreased. And um, they're attributing it to, you know, that the fact that these guys were able to eat an hour before. There's a saying, an army marches on its stomach. But sometimes we forget how much it matters that the troops are properly fed. Nikki and I might have seemed a little picky about our lunch, but really, the meals today are way better than the ones in the past. And they're better balanced, too. It's not just making sure the troops get as many calories as they need, but scientists are also focused on the overall nutritional balance of the meals. Admittedly, they're mostly adding those vitamins and micronutrients by fortifying heavily processed foods rather than through finding a way to serve whole foods. But they're trying. Look at Tom's salad bar. The thing is, it just takes forever to engineer food that can meet the military's unique challenges. I actually am going to take my hats off to the Natick Center because I think that the fact that they have been able to create a ration system that is nutritious, uh, portable, rugged, uh, can be shipped halfway around the world, can last up to three years at uh, room temperature, and can help uh, soldiers survive in the field and in battle is remarkable and has been a competitive advantage for the United States during military engagements. So yes, it's a competitive factor in it, and it's been very important. That's Anastasia. Again, she's the author of Combat Ready Kitchen. And she says not only have the breakthroughs at Natick been critical for the military, but these breakthroughs have transformed what we can find on our supermarket shelves. In fact, the subtitle of her book is How the U.S. Military Shapes the Way You Eat. So we asked her to walk us around an imaginary supermarket and show us some of the foods the military has had its hand in. We started off in the produce department. One of the things is the packaged greens and salads that people like 
to buy. I know I certainly do because there's, you don't have to clean them and we Americans hate cleaning anything. So the technology there are modified and controlled atmospheric packaging, which was developed during the 1960s to uh, better preserve things like lettuce and celery to send to Vietnam. That's one example. And remember those breakthrough foil packages? You've probably used them too. Think about Capri Sun or tuna in a pouch. All of that is only possible because of the military. If we move into the meat section, there are actually two, at least two major influences. The first is something no one would think of, which is that the meat is served cut off the bone and packaged in the different cuts. And that is actually goes back to World Wars One and Two, um, when the military got the idea that it would uh, reduce costs if they didn't have to ship over um, carcasses and instead started to slice meat off at the point of, of slaughter and pack it up into boxes. And a final meat product would be the high pressure processing, which is also used to create lines of preservative free deli products. This high pressure processing on labels, it's sometimes called cold processing because it doesn't involve heat. It's a fancy way of sterilizing food. And it's also the trick used to keep those shelves of expensive fresh juices good for days. Next aisle I am in, let's say I'm looking at some freeze dried uh, coffee and freeze dried tea. As we mentioned earlier, freeze drying was developed by the military, though it never really took off there. And then Anastasia walked us over to the bakery aisle. That relies on a military breakthrough called an intermediate moisture food, which is created by um, knowing how to control and predict something called water activity and allows you to create moist and chewy things at room temperature. So um, all sorts of cookies and, of course, our beloved granola bars. Again, in that aisle, you might have supermarket bread, which is kept soft and fresh for weeks um, by virtue of an enzyme that is supplied by a heat resistant bacteria. The idea for this again came from the military during the 1950s when they were looking for a way um, to create a canned bread. All of the pepperoni hot pockets and those cheese filled combos snack things and those pre-made PB&J uncrustable sandwiches all of those are made possible by the same techniques Michelle used for the military pizza. It's about stopping the water in the soggier ingredient from getting into the drier crust. That, plus the enzymes that keep the bread soft forever. And now we've made it to the checkout counter. There you might find some Pringles. They're made of dehydrated potatoes using a method developed by the military. And you'll probably also see M&Ms, which were developed during World War II as a way to give the soldiers chocolate that wouldn't melt. When we get to that checkout counter and look back at the store, if we were removing all items that had a military origin or influence, I estimate that the store would be half empty, at least. This is the hidden story about military food. It has a huge impact on what we eat. The cost to do all the research and develop these techniques is spent in military labs, and then processed food manufacturers can just jump on it and use it to create new products for our tables. We went to Natick to try rations, but really, you can eat the products of military R&D anytime you want. In fact, you probably did today already without even thinking. After all, consumers also want food that's convenient and portable and doesn't go bad. In the end, feeding soldiers is just a more extreme version of the same set of challenges. So yeah, what the military eats matters to us too. Thanks this episode to the team at the U.S. Army Natick Soldier Research Development and Engineering Center, particularly David Assetta, who gave up his day to make ours so fascinating. Thanks also to the scientists we met at the Food Engineering and Analysis team, Michelle Richardson, Lauren Alexic, Tom Yang, and Mary Shera. Thanks also to Anastasia Marx de Salcedo, the author of Combat Ready Kitchen, How the U.S. Military Shapes the Way You Eat. We have a link to her book on our website. We'll be back in two weeks for a show that involves one of our favorite substances and efforts to replace it. 
But first, spring is here, and that means spring cleaning is too. Mr. Clean Magic Eraser works like magic. It cleans off the tough stuff, sprays, and wipes canned, like burnt-on stains on the stovetop and that stubborn ring around the bathtub. Plus, it's so easy to use. You just wet, squeeze, and it's ready to erase. See what cleaning wonders it can do for your home by visiting mrclean.com slash gastropod. Did you know that your skin can absorb up to 60% of what you put on it? So what goes on your skin can be as important as what goes in your body. Juice Beauty is a skincare and makeup line that is made with certified organic ingredients with the promise to always formulate without potentially harmful ingredients. Go to juicebeauty.com slash gastropod for exclusive savings on your first order when you use the code gastropod20 at checkout. 